Well, I think we have, uh, and if I if I completely destroy the pronunciation of this, I'm going to go with Ogre343. If I'm wrong on that, please let me know. That's fine. Uh, That's fine. Now, are you are you who Stanning was referring to? Are you the geophysicist? Yeah, I have a degree in geophysics. Yeah. A quick sidebar question for you um, before we talk about the debate. <laughs> you work in like oil and gas. I recently asked one of my brothers. I'm an educator. One of my brother-in-law is a uh, he's a geophysicist. In, geophysicist in the uh, oil and gas world. Yeah, he he chose money over his soul. So yeah, I'm a <laughs> I'm an educator. I I don't uh, I don't work in oil and gas. Sadly, hence the lack of super chat. I, I would just like to point out really quick that in my debate, I, I only had time to provide a sliver of the evidence for the flood. There's a mountain more that, of physical features of the geomorphology of the Earth that I didn't even begin to discuss that are uh, powerful evidences for the flood. You know, you only have so much time and you can only provide, you know, a sliver of, of information. But there's oh, yeah. These more. topics are huge. No question. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Since Ogre, since you, um, I'm just looking at your channel. Since you're a geologist, um, perhaps you could help me a, look, a little bit uh, understand some of the geology points that he brought up. And um, it looks like you are um, not a physicist, so just by judging by your videos. Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny I'm here. Enough. Do you remember some 10 some odd years ago when you used to debate people on a website called like Vox or something? Had all those little Vox. dots everywhere. Well, uh, I, I did a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 maybe I, I was in there maybe a half a dozen times altogether. Yeah. I remember talking to you like 10 years ago back on that format. So okay. it's, I'm not surprised you don't remember me, but yeah, it's, it's kind of weird talking to you again live <laughs> 10 okay. years later. Okay, nice ladies and gentlemen, coming. I think that we may have, we may have the beginnings of a epic debate coming between <laughs> Ogre and Nephilim Free. I mean, this has been building up for 10 <laughs> years, ladies and gentlemen. 10 years. Neph didn't even know it, but Ogre has been <laughs> <Neph> waiting <laughs> in the wings for an opportunity to come back in and challenge him. So, I mean, <laughs> what, what do we say? Or should we should we start setting this up? I mean, what, what are we what are we thinking about here? And obviously, oh, if you, oh, you, you, I'm not trying to press you on this. I'm, I'm getting some entertainment out of this. But uh, if you do want to debate, I, I wager. I mean, we've got we've got standing in the audience right now. I mean, he's in the stream. We can set this up right now. It could be the debate of the century, and you know, I'm addicted to hosting debates, participating in debates. I mean. As, as I said, answer my life. <laughs> before you answer my question about uh, wanting to debate an Ephilim free ogre, the uh, just for the audience is entertainment. So standing for truth is not kidding when he's talking about being addicted to debates. So we usually go about three weeks and then SFT, you know, send me a message and be like, okay, dude, we've been doing this too much. I've got to take a break. I'm, I'm not doing a debate for like two weeks. I'm doing nothing with debates for two weeks. Usually about five to six days in, there'll be a message like, "Hey, I'm having a debate tonight." <laughs> Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. yeah we're, we're, okay. We're My browser, I think, is crashing, so I may have to drop out and come right back in. Okay, I'll be I'll be looking for you in the back in the okay. back now. But the, uh, yeah, in regards to that debate, if you, I mean, my schedule's kind of booked up. I, you know, I'm I'm teaching in this current environment, so. I do a lot of online stuff, but yeah, we'll just have the conversation, figure something out, I'm sure. All right. Well, I mean, SFT, it sounds like uh, you're, you need to put your booking agent hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gave, hey, there's two of you now, dang. Uh, I gave one of your mods my email and stuff like that, so. Perfect, perfect. Well, we are... Always looking for new, you know, debaters, especially people who are respectful in, in dialogue. That's why we love having David on. He's respectful. Uh, you sound respectful as well. So I think those are always the best. Kinds I have of no people. problem being respectful. Don't dig too deep into my channel. I'm not always the most respectful person, but um, I, I can more than keep myself fine on a conversation. So. Well, we can all get a little aggressive here and there. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I don't like aggression. <laughs> well, maybe we should get uh, Ogre's opinion on, on the debate then. What, what do you think, John? Yeah, absolutely, man. Go ahead. The, the floor is yours, and then we'll yeah, let uh, um, Crystal come in. I was having a go at it with your mods about it. Um, David, you definitely sounded young. No question about that. Um, Nephilim has a, does a very good job of continuing to talk a lot. And granted, I don't know how the, how the conversation works on this particular channel, but you got to jump in there, dude. You, I mean, there was times that he was going five, what, four or five minutes in a row because you wouldn't stop it to step in there. He'd ask you five, six questions, you know? You seemed like you got lost a lot. Yeah, I did. And that's the thing when someone kind of, I, I honestly, I'll, I'll be honest, perfectly honest here. I feel like um, Nephilim Free did kind of um, filibuster some of the time. Um, so well, I, but that's on you too, isn't it? I mean, I was talking about yeah. that. Lot, well, even if I could jump in. So, for example, after Neff would end what he was saying, oftentimes with a question, I would be pretty clear and almost adamant, like, hey, David. You, yeah. We're just going to sit here and let you. So for me, when I debate, I've had over 60. I've always, and I'm not sure if you do the same, but I typically have either a Microsoft Word document opened up or I will have a pen and paper. And therefore, as the person is talking, I did this with, with Dr. Garrett a couple of weeks ago or maybe a week ago in our debate. And sometimes he would go on. He'd talk for five minutes straight and I'd be writing down all the points. And then when it's my turn, I'll take equal time and I'll make sure I'm addressing all those points. So it is kind of on you that when Neff is done talking and you're now um, allowed to have equal time, that is where you as, as the debater is are supposed to, you know, address the points, answer the question. Right. So and sometimes part of my issue is that I, sometimes I kind of get frame freeze and like, okay, how do I want to address this point? Uh, that's one thing that I like about text debates is that I have some time to, actually research it and then respond uh, instead of having to come up with a response on the fly. So, yeah. Yeah, that's got you there, bud. He has no problem coming up with answers on the fly. So, Yeah, and over, what did you think about some of the issues that he brought up, like with the rock folds and stuff like that? I wasn't quite sure even where to begin with that. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I, sh I showed up sort of at the beginning. Um, I would have answered them differently, I think. I, again, I have a bit more experience in this field. Um, I was fact check some of his numbers he kept giving numbers that i didn't know where he was getting them from now maybe you could answer this where'd you get that bison number from that like 10 or 12 bison number uh, just research if you look into it you'll find that the, uh the bison nearly went extinct in the early 20th century because yeah, of excessive I, hunting I, right I and it was down, down to a there. very small population well <laughs> How big is that? How big is that population? Uh, well, the information got down like eight hundred and fifty. You said it got down to okay. ten. Those are not no, the same not, no, I didn't say ten. I said a few. Uh, I said several dozen. Um, so uh, I, I don't know. There's probably varying opinions about how many. You, some sources might say a hundred. Exactly. Uh, or, That's why I was or, or a couple of hundred, know. and other sources might say uh, you know uh, fifty or sixty. Uh, That's the sources I I provided. I don't recall what the source is. Yeah. Okay, what I'm looking at right now says uh, bison from 30 million to 325. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. looking at I'm looking at uh, that's like the what first are the sources, Google, right? so that's pretty low. Yeah, but still, I mean, it's, it's also interesting to know that uh, once the population of bison, uh, th that early population of bison that did exist in, at that moment was divvied up and sent to various states around the country, and they produced other populations after. Yeah. Uh, I, so yeah that, I, I don't want to get into that 200 a, was broken up into you know a dozen different groups, and they were shipped around to repopulate the bison. Some would have been yeah. sent to Montana, others to North Dakota, and, and some to Colorado. See, and so it was divided up, and they all produced healthy populations. Yeah, Neff, Neff. The my question was, what would where did you get your numbers from? I, yeah, I don't recall exactly what source it was, but the one source that I recall said it was down to several dozen. Well, and that's that's part of the thing that you know. And maybe, uh, David, this goes to you a bit. You always got to check the numbers on the people as well. I mean, of course. I, I don't blame Neff for not having any. Yeah, but, 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 but Ogre, you know, you know what, I don't dude, blame him for that. But, but. Ogre, you know, that kind of uh, attempt to de debunk a point based on, oh, is your number exactly correct? No, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. Well, no, no, dude, 
listen, we deal with this kind of crap in the debates all the time. When, when uh, people usually are on your side of the equation, whether it be in evolution, <laughs> whatnot, the second you start getting freaking annihilated on the logic, it's a which uh, uh, citation, please. I, what's your literature? What's your literature? I need a citation, and you pull up a citation <laughs> that shows it, and it's like, well, I haven't read that one, so I don't know. And then it's like, okay, well, I don't know how many more, and you pull up another one. Well, I haven't read that paper either, so I don't know if what you're yeah, saying is true. Yeah, and it's I, like, well, okay, we're not talking about we're talking about conceptually. So are yeah. you are you agreeing or disagreeing with the concept that's being presented, or are we going to argue over whether or not the citation is off by a number, like by two? Mm -hmm. So and if, and if I'm off by two, is that Nick doesn't negate the overall point? That's the that's the argument yeah. I'm making right now. Uh, like, it's really, really, it gets really I, annoying in the debates. It's like, are you actually? And I'm, I'm not directing this to you. I'm talking in general. Yeah. Like, are we actually having a actual dialogue and a debate about things from a macro level, or are we going to sit here and argue over BS minutia to the extent that we don't actually come to reasonable conclusions, and the audience has to have an opportunity to come to conclusion based on the macro versus yeah. this my microscopic little myopic uh, talking point that we can argue all day from a semantic perspective. Uh, do well, you I'd like to make one quick it? point, oh. Ogre, just one quick. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, that, that's okay. It'll be quick. One thing that comes to mind on that one, John, is, and, and I agree with what you're saying there, especially in debates, Dr. Dan, for example, you know, we're discussing ERVs and other classes of retro transposons and he goes into the minutia and says oh you know you're wrong ERVs are not a subclass of retro transposons you know just kind of wasting time on on such a uh, minute detail when in fact you can find paper after paper source after source that directly states ERVs really are a subclass of retro transposons and then I show that to him and he says well yeah some people think that but there's debate among scientists but my whole point is something like that is just a complete waste of time. It's avoiding the actual key issues, the bigger picture. And I, and I do find that a lot debating evolution. I'm not saying you're like that ogre, but I've personally encountered that many times. So um, I feel you guys, believe me, I do. Uh, when I watch debates and on other channels as well, it always gets drug, drugs in the mud. No one likes that. hundred percent agree with you. Um, the reason I brought up the bison question to Neff was because it was about the genetic bottleneck, right? And the argument is, the argument that David was making is, if the population gets too small, it can't grow again without genetic problems, right? Yeah, well, that was part of my issue. And if you have all the genetic everything, all all of life during the down to two or seven individuals, they'll go extinct pretty quickly. I mean. Um, the problem is you're you're not going to get the hyper rapid evolution that the blood model is going to require. If you're gonna uh, you're gonna need to get all the extra value of diversity within a couple hundred to a thousand years maximum after the flood, you simply can't do that if everything was um, reduced down to only two individuals. You would um, end up um, you would end up um, having to create like several thousand new species each day to create the extra biodiversity that is represented in art just very shortly after the flood. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess, I mean, I this isn't my field, right? I do I deal with rocks. Living things suck. I hate them. I never studied them. But there, I'm sure there's a number that a population can get down to where there isn't a problem where it is, right? I think cheetahs have that issue where the cheetah population got so low that they have these issues with defects, right? Yeah, and that's, that's what well, what's funny about that is is your cheetahs right now are down to like the last time I checked, they're down to about seven thousand. They're highly degenerate. Uh, conservationists are incredibly worried about them. They were at ten thousand at one point, but they're in, incredibly close genetically due to inbreeding, due to a severe bottleneck. And I always yeah. bring it around to because oftentimes the critics they will say that biblical creationists have a bottleneck problem when in fact your very own out of Africa scenario, which suggests that there was a population bottleneck of between two and 10,000, not for one generation, not for two generations, but for thousands of years, we know that that would result in the fixation of many, many deleterious mutations that have accumulated for millions of years. you got the Australopithecines evolving into Homo erectus, Homo erectus into Homo sapiens, and then you got the bottleneck. So how, according to your model, can 
we believe, why would we believe that that extremely genetically compromised population of say two to 10,000 that would have been so highly inbred, how did they suddenly explode into all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the planet like the out of Africa scenario would suggest? So my point is, it seems like the evolutionary story is the one with the, the inbreeding problem. So let me let me point out something real quick before he answers that. I pasted in the side chat the source that I used for my discussion about bison. It comes from a, 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 it was off of Wikipedia cit citation in Wikipedia, which states in North America in the early 20th century there was less than 100 bison living on the on the continent. So I just point that out. Yeah, I saw that. Thanks, Neff. Yeah, and I found another paper from like the intertribal bison something or other they said it got down to 200 like below 250 was another one i found yeah the numbers are probably going to vary uh <clears throat> i i think uh, if you study evolution theory you'll find the and the genetic diversity of creatures that live in this world you find that it's it, it's genetic genetic diversity is going down everything on this planet is moving towards extinction because of the accruing uh, mutations, especially single nucleotide variants uh, that are affecting protein codes and adding diseases left and right to human beings and everything else. We're all going extinct. That's the opposite of evolution. Okay, so this is kind of like a kind of where I wanted to kind of I wanted to go in the after show because I know Stan and Patrick and I were kind of discussing that in the um, chats. Stan and Patrick said that um, 300 um, generations is the maximum time frame before we wipe ourselves out naturally due to the accumulation of um, homogeneous mutations, correct? Well, I mean, if, if human oh, beings have been experiencing oh, random mutations for the time uh, that the evolutionist believes humans have existed, just humans, I mean, I, I mean, we could apply the same uh, uh, reasoning to every creature that came before every creature in the evolutionary tree, the imagined uh, tree, uh, then there simply would be no evolution. No organism can exist for uh, tens of thousands of years accruing mutations at the rate at which human beings do. It would simply rewrite our genomes with thymine because uh, the majority of mutations that re the single nucleotide variants replace uh, when a replacement of a a base uh, nucleotide occurs more often than not not always but more often than not it's replaced with thymine so over a, a, a period of 50 million years a very large percentage of the human genome should have been turned into nothing but thymine instead of cytosine uh, uh, guanine and uh, uh, it's uh, it, all the base pairs we should have uh, massive numbers of thymine in there just corrupting the heck out of our genome and making us unsuitable for survival. So the evolutionist believes that mutation is this fantastic designer of unfathomable complexity and efficiency and function. But real science shows us mutations are destroyers. So evolutionism is pseudoscience in, in, in denial of what the actual scientific data shows. Well, not only, and David, um, and, and Ogre can, and I know it's not your expertise, Ogre, but my, my question about the out of Africa scenario, because you and I, David, we discussed this in our debate a few days ago on the origin of genetic diversity. And as you know, evolution explains the origin of all DNA differences, all genetic diversity as the result of mutations over time. And the natural selection acts upon that variation. So here's the thing, by the time you reach that out of Africa event where you have that uh, very significant population bottleneck, mutations have been accumulating for millions and millions of years. And now, as, as we know, by definition, inbreeding exposes the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. Those mistakes that have been accumulating, they're in a recessive state, they're now manifested and they lead to rapid and accelerated genetic degeneration. So um, David, how do you explain how that's remotely even plausible in the out of Africa event because of the significant inbreeding. Can you answer that question, David? Before David responds, um, Zach Brannigan, as usual, is an idiot, as you can see from his chats. Whoa, I just realized we were wrong all along. It's not the atheist world that's terrifying. It's the Christian one. We're all going extinct and dying because God got mad we ate an apple. Good night. Yeah, well, good night, Zach. Well, Zach, 
as usual, your dumbass seems <laughs> incapable of comprehending the premise that you have an immortal soul that can live for eternity and not have to worry about going extinct. So I don't really know what's terrifying about the premise of immortality and not being bound by the limitations of the current version of the mortal coil. <clears throat> that does to me doesn't actually seem all that terrifying. It's actually kind of cool. Um, it's just a matter of actually opening your mind to the bigger picture and not being so myopic in your uh, worldview. Now, well, um, he, he could it, get the gift of eternal life from Christ if he wished it, but he won't, he won't, he doesn't want to live forever. But yeah, now, David, sorry for my little diatribe there. Go ahead and uh, respond to uh, SFT's uh, question. Can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. I'm kind of <laughs> well, like, I, I got to say, I'm, I, I think I repeated it twice. <laughs> it's the same stop. question. Hey, David, yeah. I asked you that question, uh, I think, in all every uh, one of our previous four debates. So here, here I'll, I'll make it quick. How is the out-of-Africa population bottleneck even remotely plausible due to all the enormous amounts of deleterious mutations that have been accumulating? They are now manifested. And as we know, the out-of-Africa population bottleneck wasn't one generation, wasn't two generations. It's hard to find a number, but it's at least more than a thousand years in order to reduce uh, levels of heterozygosity because they invented that uh, hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck. Why? Because when they discovered that humans have incredibly low genetic diversity, they were shocked. They did not predict this. Therefore, they hypothesized that there must have been an incredible bottleneck in the past that would have reduced uh, genetic diversity, but that would have resulted in incredible genetic damage. So how is that uh, out of Africa scenario even remotely plausible, David? Go ahead. Okay, yeah, this is something that I'm going to be working a video on because this is something that I'm sorry. Well, Dave, you got to speak up. I can't hear you. Okay, is this any better? A little bit. Yeah, so, um, I hate you. I, I'm not deflecting or anything, but I am going to make a video about that. Um, it is 1245-ish almost, so I'm starting to kind of doze off. And well, David, instead of making a video on it, can you just um... – See, here's the problem. We're looking at the cheetahs today, and we know what bottlenecks do, okay? Bottle and here's the thing. I debated a biologist on it, and he was kind of uh, thrown off as well. So I don't know if you could have a better answer than a, a biologist, but we know by definition inbreeding is not – a good thing. And the more deleterious the mutations are based on how functional our genome is, if the majority of mutations are deleterious, that means those 100 new mutations per person per generation that are accumulating are degenerating our biological information systems a lot faster than we ever thought. Therefore, David, if those nearly neutral mutations are invisible to natural selection, we know natural selection acts upon the best beneficial mutations, gets rid of the worst detrimental mutations. But my question to you is, what type of selection can you provide us with tonight that can remove so many slightly deleterious mutations that are pouring into our genomes generation after generation, David? So are you talking about like the mutations like the sickle cell amenia that have like a double-edged swords where it can be beneficial but not beneficial as well? Is that what we're kind of going at? No, he's asking you what genetic mechanism saves us from the mutation rate. I, well, of course, natural selection is what would it be. Well, that's what he's asking. How is that to work? Yeah. Because I'm telling you, I'm pointing out that everybody agrees natural selection keeps a species as strong as it can be. It's a fine tuning mechanism. Natural selection better understood as differential reproduction. Who's reproducing the most? Natural selection will remove the worst deleterious mutations, okay? Only it can worry. see that. And it will amplify once in a while a beneficial mutation that is context environmentally dependent. Oftentimes they're reductive, for example, like sickle cell anemia. Yeah, it's got a significant benefit, significant impact, but it's due to a broken cell, broken protein, broken gene. It's reductive, not taking things forward. So the question is those slightly deleterious mutations that are kind of like a single spelling mistake in a book the size of an encyclopedia. You can't see each one. Each one on its own is inconsequential, but it's the buildup of them over time that degrade the book, the message in the book, and uh, in, in biological information systems degrades uh, us. 
us slowly, like Russ on a car. So what type of mechanism, David, can you provide us with tonight that can get rid of these uh, mutations that are deleterious pouring into our genome? Yeah, um, I'm not going to run off the top of my head again. Um, I am going to bed pretty soon. Um, I'm just, <laughs> the, the important point, the really truly important point that, that Standing for Truth is making is that natural selection can't see anything except the worst mutations, the most destructive. It does not see the vast majority of mutations. They're, they're invisible to natural selection. It, uh, or uh, reproduction passes on mutants, entire mutants with all their mutations. The only ones that are, are going to become so unfit to survive are those that receive a mutation that makes them un, 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 uh, uh, un you know, un, uh, so so degenerate that that they won't be selected by by uh, for breeding because their ma the mates won't accept them, or or they just have are so ridden with disease that they're all they don't survive. So natural selection can't see the vast majority of mutations. They uh, so like I, I got a question on this topic, if you don't mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I, this is I, I. This is not my area, David. If I start going off track, let me know. Right. I play with rocks, but um. Neff, you seem to be talking about mutations as in like the big ones. Like I'm born with three feet and none of them works on mutation. No, but I mean it, all kinds of diseases. Well, uh, but you said mutations, they it gets rid of the it gets rid of the bad ones. I'm I'm right. just quoting you here. Well the worst. But isn't aren't mutation something that like technically a mutation is just some any particular change over time, right? Right. So, what so is the effect of? Is, is the, the argument you know, you're making that with the genetic bottleneck as uh, standing is the argument you're making that we those little teeny mutations with two full of those? Is that what's going on here? Or yeah, yeah because because the majority of mutations are nearly neutral. The yes. beneficial mutations, according to Lenski's experiment, they're incredibly rare, but one in a million. Sure. And then the incredibly detrimental ones. Um, you know, we've kind of removed natural selection as a human population. We take care of the sick. But in the wild, if um, an animal is born with an incredible defect, it will die. Natural selection will remove it from the, the population. It's not going to reproduce, right? Who well, or breeding selection. It won't be selected as a mate because the other that... members of the population will see it as defunct and they'll reject it. Oh, good night. <laughs> Yeah, take your time, Ogre. We've been talking a lot. I, I was just trying to get an answer out of David, but he is he's tired and that's fine. Yeah. So, well, I, yeah. I, yeah, I mean I'm just trying to I'll I'll do the best I can here completely off my basis, but I'm trying to get a, I want an understanding of your point that way I can think about it correctly, right? Strong manny, I think it's called. So yeah, that's what I'm trying manny. to ask. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to ask you these questions. So standing, your arg the argument for the bottleneck issue is the Africa, the humans, when they left Africa, accrued so many negative mutations, teeny ones, that they should have died off. What? What? Uh, so, it, well, in Africa, they say Homo erectus. Well, according to the literature, there was two out of Africa. It's a subgroup of erectus left. They would have independently evolved into like Neanderthalensis, Heidelbergensis, Nelidae, Floresiensis out of Africa. Because the problem was when modern uh, homo sapiens left Africa, it was a big surprise that there were other people groups, other- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They ran into them in like Europe and stuff, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so there, were, there were people groups outside of Africa. But the thing is, modern homo sapiens evolved from erectus in Africa, but they didn't leave Africa until they experienced a severe population bottleneck that would have um, decreased levels of genetic diversity because we know human state are 99.99% similar. So yeah. therefore the uh, scientists, they um, look to this population bottleneck to explain that. But here's the thing, it wasn't one or two generations, it was similar to the cheetahs. Therefore that hypothetical population, some say 2,000. Okay, you know. I, I get the connection you're going. So yeah, okay. we, know, okay, go we know cheetahs, we know bison, to throw it back, have these uh, problems in their genetic code. Why don't humans have that same problem? Is that, what you, is that the statement? Well, no, it, it's... 
in, in the out of Africa event, that population of two to 10,000 would have been so genetically compromised comparable to the cheetahs we see today. Yes. Therefore, this is what the evolutionists say, say we came from, the out of Africa scenario, we came, we came from Africa. But that population would have been so genetically compromised there's no feasible way that they could have suddenly exploded in all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the planet because they would have assimilated yeah, yeah. or, or um, yeah. So in your opinion, or, you know, how, how is that plausible given how genetically uh, damaging that bottleneck would have been? Go ahead. Um, all right. So again, no expert, right. Um, but I would have to make the assumption you know what? I'm not even going to try here. I play with rocks. I don't know. No, <laughs> I know so many okay. these processes. I can't even take a go at it. Sorry. No, it, it's definitely something worth looking at. I, I've debated, you know, <laughs> you can see some pretty in-depth discussions with some biologists I've had on this one. You know, it is yeah. uh, an issue. Well, and that's the thing. Even with the one Y chromosomal line, the one mitochondrial DNA line, we know mitochondrial DNA has incredible – uh, incredibly low variation worldwide, the Y chromosome, same thing, um, which demonstrates that our genome is young. But the evolutionists, of course, they don't uh, conclude that that we are young as a population. They have looked to this population bottleneck to reduce levels of genetic diversity. And as a result, now we are stuck with one Y chromosome line, one mitochondrial DNA line. But what's funny is this is exactly what the Bible would predict. One Y chromosomal ancestor, one mitochondrial <laughs> DNA ancestor, low genetic diversity. So we don't have to invent uh, fancy stories, this is exactly what we'd expect. In, in right. The genetic uh, data actually supports the biblical account. So, um, don't mind, I, I know your history, F, uh, Neff. Uh, staying for truth, just so I know, what is your, you seem to know a lot of the jargon. What, how? Well, I guess I've been. Um, fascinated with topics related to human origins for a while. So that's why I am, I'm, I'm more than familiar with like the out of Africa story and, and the hominin fossil record. So it's just been an interest to me. Oh, and so, therefore, so it's not a professional education. It's a, um, okay. Like I went to school, I went to college for my education job. Oh, I get what you're saying. Okay, education-wise, yeah, I do. I, I work in the medical field. I've got oh. five years of, of college education. I don't really like to give my exact. I'm not asking for exacts. So I just. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I do have biology. Yeah, you know, I always love how this question always comes up in every single one of these conversations. Whenever anybody starts talking about things, in my detail, defense, I'm new to these conversations. So, no, no, no the uh, <clears throat> where, where I'm no, going. you've been doing it for 10 years. You've been doing me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the reason you may, may not have been going down this uh, this path, path ogre, but it's one we deal with on a regular basis. Uh, yeah, I believe, especially that. from academics. And since you're an academic, that's why I'm making the statement I'm about to make, which is, uh, why the arguments, and again, I'm not saying you're doing this, I'm just putting in a caveat of, well, what's your background in this? And what's your education? What's your formal education is usually the question. And it's like, well, you know what? Uh, why does that matter if my argument is correct? And if my knowledge of the information is correct? Because we live in the era of the internet and I can get access to the exact same information that a PhD is going to look at. Sure. And if I spend copious amounts of time studying it, uh, then my knowledge, and I have an IQ above average, which I think everybody in this room does, uh, we probably have the capacity to understand it. And so, the irony okay. of ironies for me is that where things are going, because most of academia is complete BS these days, and many, many high level uh, corporations are recognizing this and are literally instituting programs to say, I give no fucks about traditional education. Um, the when I, again, I'm not pointing this at you, but we hear this all on a regular basis. It's like from uh -huh. academics of like you do realize that your entire industry is starting to like crater into complete obsolescence um, in the real world, not just in the in the academic setting. 
And, so, uh, I mean, I can, we can have that conversation if you want. I said, I teach for a living, so I don't mind talking about the pros and cons of that to a limited degree if you want. The reason I asked that um, is because I know when I was listening to Neff's conversations, I grew up very fundamentalist Christian. I watched the Ken Ham and the Kent Hovind videotapes over and over again. And a lot of the stuff that Neff, is, Neff said in that, in that debate were parroted things I heard when I was, you know, long time ago from these Ken Ham tapes is statements about sediments uh, covering the earth so many feet thick or whatever. That's something that's basically been unchanged from that time. So I asked those things because I'm wondering, are you, if he's just kind of, to me, I think there's a difference in parodying someone else's conversation and knowing someone else's conversation. If that makes sense to me, there's a difference. You may disagree, but that's how I view it. Why would the story change? Uh, the the story about the sediments. Yeah, if it's a fact, it's a fact. You don't well, change facts because because the, the, the that's the thing though is sediment is a very broad category. Uh, that's like saying you know there's a bunch of cars in the parking lot. Well, there's trucks, there's SUVs, there's station wagons, right? Just saying sediment is not a accurate representation of what's covering the earth. And it's an average sediment. And you're talking about different layers of sandstones and mudstones and shales and cherts and limestones, all these different depositional environments and metamorphic metamorphics and some places very high, some places very low. The conversation falls under more rigor. But if you just parrot this thing back and forth over and over again, you think you have it correct. Well, then you run into an issue. Because sorry, sorry, what what do I call you, uh, ogre? Yeah, ogre's been working. <laughs> o ogre, I'm a I'm a retired engineer, and um, we've done these experiments uh, in we've done flume experiments in in universities, ogre that that show that we can actually get those sedimentary layers in well, in the way you actually see them out in the field. So th that that right there, that's the question. You say those sedimentary layers. The world is in no way, shape, or form uniform in its layering amongst the different strata that exist. You say layers as if there's one type of layer that covers the earth. And no, no, la layers. Where, where you I are, said you layers. Go miles to the west, you have a completely different group, a completely different uh, organization. So, and it's not random what's over there compared to what you have. But just saying sediments makes it seem like there's some sort of uniformity to it. Well, do you know anything about mega sequences? Yes. Well, there, there's a large number of mega sequences that cross a uh, number of continents. So I'm not sure whether you continents? think the, the entire Earth would be covered in the one material uh, because of the flood. But, you know, the, the Earth is a pretty big place. Well, wait, I'm, not, I'm the one saying it's not covered in one thing because of the flood. Well, that's correct. Why would you expect it to be covered uh, by the same layer all over the place? Well, that goes to the point I was making is that when you say the Earth's covered in so many feet of sediment, it kind of sounds uniform, but it's not. So then you get, have to get in the conversation of why isn't it? How is the flood going to deposit something that on my neck of the woods looks like a receding sea line going limestone to shale to sandstone and then going back out again. And in your neck of the woods, we have uh, various layers of igneous. And then over here, another neck of the woods, we have nisic and we have schistic rocks going on here. That's metamorphosed lake beds. How do you have, you know, that's the point I'm trying to make. Well, well the different parts of the world. I mean, the, the other thing you need to consider is if you're talking about millions of years then you have to ask the question why do all those sedimentary layers are so uniform with the same material sure you think after millions of years there'd be what, an intermix what, what, of materials i don't i'm saying they're not uniform they're not uniform well they're they, clearly they are, you, they're you just, representative of the depositional environments well you, you only need to look at say the grand canyon you can see uh different layers uh very yes. clearly yeah and the grand canyon has uh certain beds in it that line up with other layers throughout the world there's uh grand canyon's a, a favorite it's very well studied right 
and the the top of the Grand Canyon lines up, I think, with the bottom of Zion National Park. So you have an entire stratigraphy going on from the top of Zion National Park down to the bottom of Grand Canyon that's connected via, I think, a limestone layer that runs index fossils the same. And the mapping has shown that. So, but that but that particular stratigraphic sequence is due to the depositional environment in that particular part of America. You go up to you go up to New England, you find nothing like that because the depositional environments were the same. Well, the the limestone layer that crosses, um, say, from Dover to uh, through Europe, and I think it runs all the way through to the Middle East and even parts of America. So, I, I don't know. Is the, why... the cliffs of Dover that particular? Uh, yeah, that's formation. Li- yeah, well, that's limestone. It it runs all the way across through to France and most of Europe and across into the Middle East and, and parts of America. Uh, I'm not familiar, super familiar with this, so I need to take a quick second to find out what you're talking about. But well, even that, if you, I mean, I'll take your word for it that this particular limestone deposit covers vast, vast swaths. It mm. doesn't that well, limestone is the result of usually ocean floors and um, chemical. Uh, what's, what's what I'm looking for here? It's a it's a sedimentary rock that's the result of chemical. Uh, my God, I'm losing my words. It's late. The point the point I'm trying to make though is that's a particular depositional environment. That's the bottom of a a lake or bottom of an ocean. But you have ex- timed out the exact same as those cliffs of Dover, different deposits throughout the world at the exact same time. So you have a lake at you have a lake where the cliffs of Dover is or an ocean, but then you also have igneous deposits you have sandy deposits you have you know things that aren't a lake at deposited at the same time because different depositional environment may i ask you something or real quick yeah what's, what's up uh, do you say you do you study rocks right correct yeah yeah that works <laughs> have, have, have you um, viewed any poly um straight trees i have i physically seen them no but i am familiar with them Okay, you've never physically seen any. Well, I mean, it doesn't really matter if you I haven't physically seen them. Okay, what what are your uh, uh, thoughts on those? Um, I'm assuming you're asking how do they come about. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I live in Tennessee, and we've got a really good example of one. Um, um, um well, go ahead. I usually, don't stu- when you get when you take classes in geology, you don't study polystrate fossils, polystrate trees. Those are like an exception, right? right? Um, well, I mean, they are, and they aren't, but I mean, yeah, well, they're, I'm saying they're not, not in, the, in the scope of geology, it's not something, yeah. That's I mean, they're not like, wanna, yeah, if you want to like, work in a mine, as calm as granite really or something, yeah, I yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. But, um, but, believe, but yeah, given that they are rare, um, well, you know, like, I believe you do find it, you do find are, it more, you do find more than one of them, yes, Isn't yes. that a, a little curious to how they g- get to those layers? Uh, I believe polystrate uh, trees are the result of flood deposits, if I remember correctly. Turbulent water, lots of stuff dropping at the same time. The trees get stu- stuck in the mud that way, if I remember correctly. Correct right, but see, we, ha- we have a really good one in Tennessee that's on a, on a mountain. Cool. You, you, you see the problem there? So you, you, your argument <laughs> is It's going to take a lot of flood water to get up there to that mountain. Yeah, your argument is that how did the flood get that high, right? Yeah. Um, the again, I don't. I have no idea what exactly you're talking about. Right? I don't know the map. Maybe, the maybe I'll get the link put in off, side chat for you, well, and you can look off at the it top too. of my off the top of my head. The probably the most common example would be that flooding happened, and then an uplifting occurred after that was deposited. So you had whatever caused the polystrate tree to form that caused that to form. And then over time, something caused it to lift up, and that mountain range was formed. And what happened to be on top of that mountain range was a previous old flood deposit. You know, for example, 100 million years ago, big flood. 60 million years ago, mountain starts popping up. Uh, Oga, okay. are, are you a geologist? Uh, I have a degree in geophysics. Uh, do, do you know, do, have you heard of the name uh, uh, James Galuli? Uh, not a friend of mine, to my knowledge. I don't know him. 
Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, introduce, I'll um, introduce you to that name. Um, the reason why I joined the chat, uh, I, actually, I actually posed the question to David during the debate about the erosion rates, but I had some trouble with um, the internet, so I, I couldn't join this chat earlier. But I'll, I'll just explain, okay? Uh, doc, Dr. James Galuli, probably one of the most cited geologists of his time, that's the 50s and 60s and early 70s, um, just, uh, even way back when he um, calculated the average erosion rates, he, he determined uh, that the landscape would uh, erode down to sea level in 9.1 million years. Now, that, that's, those experiments have been verified and repeated by a number of people and I had those citations for for David Neff, but he's no longer here. But uh, f further studies that were undertaken hey, hey, George, late. Was this, George, is this that paper you uh, link you shared with me? Yes, that's right. Hey, we keep talking. Uh, I'll keep talking. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up. Yeah. Um, so a number of other geologists um, and uh, departments actually uh, went out and verified those, and they came up with. Um, uh, a duration of 11 to 12 million years. So uh, th it seems like the erosion rate of six centimetres per thousand years is f fairly accurate. The secular geologists agree on that. And one of the examples I use is Grand Canyon. The difference between the plateau of the Grand Canyon to the actual entry where the river comes in is, is around 1,600 metres. And if you look at the secular dates for the canyon at 70 million years, that works out to uh, 0 0.02 millimetres per year. The six centimetres per thousand works out to 0 0.06 millimetres per year. So the erosion rate is three times... Oh, or you've got some comments. Three times the actual uplift, the, the, the supposed uplift. So... Uh, yeah, appealing, appealing to uplift doesn't work because the erosion rate actually um, is greater than uh, – sorry, the erosion rate is greater than the uplift. So <laughs> uplift doesn't help is what I'm trying to say. Um, all right. So, again, I'm not familiar with this particular topic. I will say um, – this is probably pointless of me to say, but I'm not an expert on everything. I'm – you – you know, you're asking me something that I haven't studied, so <laughs> it's it's okay if I don't know the answer, right? Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, sure, I, sure, sure. Yeah, no, yeah. We, so we don't expect you on know, the answer. Just, just, just there, times, John, just there. Just there. Yeah, we're, just, six we're, centimeters. we're just share, sharing some stuff. Yeah, I found the paper you're talking about by S.R. Taylor, 66. Um, well, it's on the screen right now, Ogre. Yeah, I know. I found the paper so I can scroll it on my own without having... Okay. Uh, Without having, I don't know the guy's name. Who's the guy that told us right? Call you. Oh, the the initial the initial geologist was Doctor Doctor Jalu. Oh, sorry, my name my name is George. Are you talking George. about me? I, I'm you call me LPP. And then, LPP. Yeah, George, George is the gentleman we're talking. Yes, about. George. You're referring to uh, Taylor sixty six, the origin growth of continents, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I found the paper. Um, I haven't read it. But your explanation says he calculated the continents erode this fast. He also ca calculated that uplift couldn't account for that, right? In short, yeah, yeah, yes, but but I'm, I'm giving you uh, actual examples at the Grand Canyon where the uplift doesn't work, and yes. I've actually done some further research on you know you know the uh, the supposed sea level rise. Uh, um, examples that they give to to sort of further the climate change. Uh, I call it bullshit, but uh, anyway, well, there there are some parts of the world, like in um, uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and I think there's um, I think the Crescent uh, in California. The, the the actual the actual sea level is dropping, so you've got a contradiction there. But when you take into account the millimeters per year that they claim the sea level is rising or, or dropping. Uh, George, can I and, stop you real quick, please? 
Yeah, I was um, just going to finish off. I was going to say if, if you if if you actually calculate that over se say seventy million or a hundred million years, you're talking about like a uh, hundred hundred or so over hundred uh, kilometers of of actual uplift, and that's ridiculous. It just doesn't work. So um, go ahead, ask me a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, LPP. Uh, don't I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> this is a uh, how do you do debates properly thing, um, George very kindly asked me a question about erosion on continents and then he asked me another question about uh water rising both very good questions not trying to knock you i promise um is it, it seems like those are two different questions with possibly two different answers am i supposed to say stop talking to me or <laughs> i don't want to be rude here but you know i'm trying to think of one thing you're telling me another thing <laughs> okay let, no, let me uh... So, sorry, I mean, they're, they're okay, connected. Go, go ahead, okay. sense, George? I mean, I, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to look into the paper you sent me, and then you start asking me about something else. You know, you're kind of piling two questions on me at the same time. I mean, if that's just how it so, goes, that's cool. But I just want to know. No, no, no. I, no, I apo apologize. You mentioned the uh, the um, the rescue device in the paper uh, uh, being uplift, and I, I was giving you actual actual results based on sea level uh, rise and dropping. Uh, certain millimeters per year, and I'm saying to you, those actual dimensions contradict what they say in the paper. That's why I mentioned it. Okay. Um, thank you. I guess I, yeah, I said I, 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 I have never heard this paper before. This is not something we talked about when I did my classes, you know. So, I, for, I mean, <laughs> for all I know, this paper is 100 percent accurate still. So I know this paper's not. I am completely unaware. So I said, I, I, you got you to have to let me look at it, homeboy. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Ogre, here's something I'd like you to consider. Imagine that the flood is true. Okay. Imagine you have a massive amount of uh, water uh, and it's heavily laden with minerals, as it would be if it's gushing out of the earth. And it begins to flow uh, from, let's say, east to west across North America. So when that happens, so like uh, it's coming out of the Atlantic Ocean. Well, the ocean there was there was no Atlantic Ocean at that time. There, there, there was Pangaea, and it, it uh, the initial waters that were part of the flood were cracked the continent, split it into pieces, and and moved it apart as separate bits. But but imagine that that water begins to flow as, as a massive sheet. And it's, it begins to make its way across the entire continent. It wouldn't rush across it, you know. It might take weeks or months for it to, to get all to 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 uh, completely inundate the entire continent. At first, it might take a, a couple of several weeks at least. So imagine that happening. Wouldn't it move materials? Wouldn't it rip up materials that are on the east? And deposit them, you know, a little further west, and some of that material gets mixed in with other material and deposited yet further west, and this would happen as the waters migrated their way across the entire North American continent. That that sounds logical, doesn't it? If the if the if the the continent is flooded over a period of a couple of months, so no, then, then it, would have, it, it would have displaced materials and deposited them elsewhere on the continent. At the same time, wouldn't it also have removed materials from the continent, dumped them in the ocean, and then materials coming out of the earth uh, from this crack in the earth where the water is gushing out from yes, uh, yes. an outrageous volume of water. Yeah, if you're, breaking, you're, you're uh, hold on, let me finish. Bring, bringing materials from inside the earth in the whole time, dumping that out onto the continents. See, yes. so this, um, I just want you to understand that so many evolutionists depict the Noahic flood like somebody filling up the bathtub with a garden hose. That's not the way it would have worked. It would have worked as I as I described, and and that would have caused um, massive um, um, areas of sedimentary strata to be the same in massive locations on the continents. That's exactly what we do see, and it would have caused various various tremendously large areas of deposition to have different types of strata 
in different locations so, on that so same continent the, at the same I, time. I, Neff, what I'm getting that's from also you, what okay, Neff, Neff, let's let Edgar respond. What I'm getting from you is, is a contradiction. You're saying that water is coming from the east to west. This water is coming from one source. It's crossing whatever the continent appeared to be at that time, right? Not North America as we currently have it. That crossed this swath of water crossed all at one time, and somehow this one particular deposition happened to create many different layers mm -hmm. and many different organizations. So one, yes. and that's something we don't see in nature, by the way. A depositional environment is associated with a deposit. Uh, beaches produce sandstones. Lake beds produce shales. Lavas produce igneous deposits. Mm -hmm. We don't see a, a flood happens you don't see a flood produce the type, the various types of layering we have in your example, mm -hmm. all over North America. Those are, those are two different statements there. No, no, no. Uh, even large local floods do create uh, numerous strata. Uh, geologist Edwin it's McKee not, I record, didn't say reported that, didn't that, that 12 feet of sedimentary strata were created in less than 48 hours. No, I didn't say they didn't create strata. The okay. thing, I think you might have been gone for here. My point is that it's not just you can't just say strata and have that be the end of the conversation. No, every no, I'm, I'm part explaining. Of, every I'm different not, part I, of I didn't. America has different geologic columns, has different uh, organizations and, of the strata, dependent on what produced it. And right. in your statement, 12, 12 feet of strata. That's a meaningless step statement because what no. is that strata? Is it sandstone? Is it mudstone? Is it some sort of nisic deposit? You have all these different things going on. So, right. so my point was, of course, that that is exactly what we do see, is that there are very vast, there are large areas of sedimentary strata that are sequenced. And we can move, you know, 1,000, 1,500 miles to the east, west, and we find a different sedimentary strata. Well, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that now. So, so let me finish hey, hey. what I'm saying, please. So you, you, you said that's not what we would see, but that is what we see. And, and we also see at the same time some layers that are found in part in one part of the continent and also found that it can be picked up, you know, there's a gap, 500, 1,000 miles or 2,000 miles, and there it is again, you know, three, four states away. So we find the, the, the flood of Noah was very complex. It wasn't like one big sheet flow goes flying across North America and, and there's uniform strata from the East Coast to the yes, West. That's, not what, statement by that, saying that's not what we would expect to see. Crossing North America. That, that's not what we would expect that. to see if the flood was true. And I explained that the flood would cause uh, various groups of strata uh, uh, across the continent, you see. All right, so Neff, a classic example of um, sedimentary layers you see everywhere is a organization of uh, limestone, shale, sandstone, mm -hmm. shale, limestone, right? Okay. We classically consider that to be a uh, some sort of body of water, a lake, a sea, what have you, that is uh, coming and going, essentially. The lake is... Uh, Starts out deep, gives you your limestone, shallows up, uh, drains out perhaps, gives you shales, eventually sandstone from the beaches, and then the lake comes back. So there's a very specific organization, right? Mm -hmm. I understand. Are you that. arguing That's... to me that a that a flood would lay down that organization? Precisely. Uh, it, it's a secular. You have uh, examples of it, floods it, doing this. It's a it's a secular uh, um, uh, uh, it's a, a um, what is the term I'm looking for? It's a rescuing device for the for the secular camp. The, you can look at a massive area and believe that water came in, left some stuff, water leaves. Water come well, in, left some stuff, and water leaves. That doesn't have to be the case. Do you know but why? It, it is do you know why geologists the only do? reason evolutionists posit this idea is because they believe that the continents were covered with sediments in different portions over vast ages of time. But the, here's the problem that, 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 that you have to consider. The strata 
strata are strata, and strata have fine, distinct boundaries one from the other. It's not like a gradation. If uniformitarianism were true, and one material becomes, de let's let's say you, your idea, there's a there's a, a, a depression in the continent, and every five or ten thousand years it gets flooded with a massive amount of water and brings in a material. Okay, and then that material slowly no longer available for deposition, and another type of material slowly begins to become deposited in that large area, and then another. This would cause the strata if we wouldn't have strata. What it would cause is one layer of material gradating. That's blending, right. that blending right. into let me let me finish please blending one material into another instead of what we observe which is strata with absolutely fine in most cases not all absolutely fine distinct boundaries where one strata ends you can clearly see it comes to an abrupt end and there's another one with a different mixture of materials right above it and goes up 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 through the geologic column so because <clears throat> because <clears throat> here's the thing so, if you, you believe that, that the, if you believe, point. unless you believe that one material is cut off from de not able to be deposited in an area, all of a sudden, like on one day or during one week, no longer can you have that material anymore. And now only a different type of mixture of material is is going to come in and flood that area for the next fifteen thousand years. And then uh, the same thing happens over and over. Then you can't explain the strata with their fine, distinct boundaries. You see, if the materials are slowly available, then slowly not available, and, and another material is slowly yourself. available. Can I respond, please. See, it's Just not possible. Right, right, right. Netflix, uh, Netflix, uh, not possible to get Netflix, the fine, Netflix, distinct respond. boundaries. You see. Thank Good. you, LPP. All right, so <laughs> you, you you have a tendency to just go now. If you gotta let you gotta let me respond. I want to your make point. sure you understand because a lot of people avoid you're, actual arguments. So your your statement to repeat you and briskly is my explanation of depositional environments changing is false because you would see it instead of having different separated layers, it would all be a continuous swath. No, it, it would be one area. one material gradiating into another material. That's what I tried to say, sure. Yeah, different yeah. word. Right. All right. Why your interpretation is incorrect. So, in nature, you go out, you go out to a lake, you see the bottom of the lake is mud, right? Over time, over a couple years, muds can continue dropping, muds continue growing on the lake bottom, right? So we, therefore, as geologists, look, and if we see rock that looks like mud, we and we look over here at this lake and we see mud, we make the connection, well, maybe these two are the same depositional environment, right? That's why we call mudstone mudstone, because it's mud, okay? Right. Um, and, you're, and the reason why you can have a nice separation between a mudstone and, say, a sandstone is because, again, that sandstone probably comes from sand. Let's say the, the beach, right? The uh, outside of the lake. The amount of time it takes for the lake bed, the lake, to dry up and for sand to start building there is very, very short compared to the amount of time the sand or the mud would be building there. A lake can recede over the course of... I don't know, 50, 100 years. But a lake could be building that mudstone for thousands and thousands of years. The Great Lakes in America have been there for thousands and thousands of years. They've been building that shale deposit, those or limestone maybe, for thousands and thousands of years. They can also be receded. They can go someplace else over the course of very short amount of time. So that layer, that fine layer you're talking about, geologically speaking is a very short amount of time but those two sections can be deposited over very long amounts of time again because that's what we see in nature mud the, there's a the problem. major problem with that is that yeah. the strata don't cover just 10 square miles they cover 10,000 yeah and miles. if you instead of having a lake right so well, lake so what, 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 well let me finish so what you're positing is uh, that 
the entire continent was produced this way. But no, you can't I'm not. explain. I'm not saying that be, at all. Because the, the continental, the strata on the continents, major sequences can be found spanning the continent. And, and, okay. and, 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 and if you have the material, one material, uh, uh, the, the boundaries, you're, you're trying to, to diminish the, the actual point I'm making. The boundaries are not just they gradiate over a period of a couple of feet. No, they come to a stop, and three millimeters later is another strata. A completely different mixture said. of material. That can't be explained by deposition that takes thousands of years. I, I just explained it. I, it what cannot. I said is the, is the way it would work, and that's the, what we it, see in our day-to-day -day lives. Right, so what and you're arguing is... happens to be... Neff, please. If you have a deposition, like I was talking about with George, that's gigantic... That is simply the depositional environment was very large. You have sandstones and shales and limestones in the uh, southwest of America that cover vast, vast swaths. The cliffs of Dover being gigantic. That means that depositional environment was really big. I but understand that. that. So, okay. The, the problem uh, with that, though, Ogre, is this. Uh, you're George, positing. You wanna, you're hey, positing. Hey, Neff, that, Neff, Neff, let's let George get in. Oh, oh, just because the the, pro the problem with that thinking, Ogre, is uh, the secular explanation to the formation of limestone, uh, especially some limestone layers are hundreds of feet thick, as uh, Neff can testify, uh, and, it, and it would require millions of years to form. Why are the limestone layers so pure? They're pure. Yeah, that's you'd another. Ex you'd, expe you'd expect some kind of... Um, mixing of other material with that limestone uh, we're not talking about an inch thick we're talking hundreds of feet thick sure sure um what, what material are you expecting any anything different to limestone well what what is would you know would you know what limestone is yes what is it chemically it's a car it's it's a carbonate it, uh, it's, calcium it's carbonate a right yeah. yes yes limestone is a calcium carbonate the result of precipitation from lake or ocean water, right? So why is it so, pure? Why is so it so pure? I'm assuming when you mean pure, you mean like it's missing um, but fossils? Or what do you mean by pure? Explain that. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, do you know I, Do you know the deposition rate of, you, uh, of you limestone? You guys talk uh, in a secular... language than I do. So when you say pure, you may know what that means, but that doesn't mean I've talked that same language. You need to explain it to me. Otherwise, we're, just, we're not going to be having a conversation. Well, where, where's all the mud in it? Where's the gr bits of granite? Where, where's the where's the sand? I don't know why like granite would be there. Yeah. But well, like well, the mud, well, mud well, was well, granite, granite erodes. Uh, sand. Where's all the sand that got mixed in? It's, as George pointed out, it's relatively pure. And and, and that would not occur so, under over yeah, vast stages. Jeff, you, you asked me a question. Let me answer. You don't need to tell me I'm wrong when I'm trying to answer the question. So, cliffs, white cliffs of Dover, right? Gigantic, beautiful rocks. Correct, George? You are you are you? Yeah, you, you yeah, yeah, yeah. I've 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 been there. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, white cliffs of Dover, big, gigantic. You, why isn't there mud there? Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I guess. Uh, I, Ogre, do you know what the secular uh, explanation is in terms of the the, for, the rate of formation of limestone? Um, top of my head, no. Well, but before it's, we go any deeper, I gotta go to bed sorry. soon. I got a baby, so I may gotta okay. make sure I can wake up at any moment. So I maybe ten more minutes or so, just so you guys know. That's cool. Okay. We appreciate appreciate your time. So, uh, formation rate of limestone. I can look that up. So, so the problem is one to two centimeters per thousand years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, at, at that rate, you're going to get all manner of things. There's going to be seaweed in there. There's going to be sand flowing in. I mean, hurricanes come and tornadoes go. So, do you I have mean, an I mean, example of know, limestone that does have these things in it? No, that's the point George is making. The sandstone so, is nearly purely calcium so carbonate your, your your complaint is limestone shouldn't be um as uniform as it is 
but you don't have an example of limestone no, not being it, uniform. It, it couldn't be so pure if that material is deposited so slowly on the ocean floor. Do you not think that the billions of animals and plants would have died and fallen into that? Do you not think there are ocean currents that bring in other materials? There are underwater sea storms. None of that occurred on the Earth until well, I, just recently? You know, for something like the uh, plant matter and stuff like that, I see no reason why that would stick around. Uh, you do find fossils of limestone, so there you yes. go. There's that. Right. But, that, that, um, that kills sand, your ideas example, about limestone. That's a decent question, right? I'm sure sand particles will get mixed up in these mm. ocean beds. I'm, why don't we find sand? Um, yeah. I, off the top of my head, right? I, don't, I haven't studied limestone. I don't know the answer to that. Is it possible that maybe there is sand at very tiny amounts? Maybe. Limestone's not my area of expertise. Um, I don't know if I can... There's quartz, but if you've ever cut through it, like limestone or granite, especially together... It's like cutting through, um, I don't know, man. It's like cutting through steel. <laughs> the, the bottom line is that the boundaries between the stratum are paper thin in most cases. Mm -hmm. and, in, and if those yeah, materials sure. were deposited, hold on. If those de materials were deposited over th periods of mega thousands of years, and then a sudden, for some reason, uh, it changed. The environment's changed, and now a, a, a predominantly different t uh, mixture of materials is available. And the other one's no longer being deposited. The abrupt change from one to another, so consistently throughout the whole geologic column, is not tenable over these vast ages of time. The only way you can explain that is by rapidly moving water, and that's exactly what university laboratories experiment verify that we they show it in the very lab they mixture they mix all manner of materials together they run them through a sleuth and it automatically sorts them into paper thin boundaries strata with paper thin boundaries. yeah now if you're going backwards a little bit here i i, I completely disagree with you where i talked about that uh george well, I that's looked, what the I universities do well I, are you not familiar with these fine, experiments apparently. you know um, they've been performing them i'm since not familiar with every single experiment that you've seen no I'm trying to. I, I'm looking up George's limestone question now. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm trying. You guys are asking me two different things, so I got to focus on one at a time. Okay. Um, well, well, while you're looking at it, uh, as Neff rightly pointed, lime, limestone. Uh, the, sec the secular story on limestone is it forms at at around two centimeters per thousand years. The question you need to ask is why do we find uh, fossils in those limestones? I mean, if it forms that slowly. Th th those creatures that are fossilized should have been scavenged, deteriorated completely, well, and you wouldn't God. find them. George, the answer no. to my answer to that would be fossilization is, I'm sure we'd all agree, a rare instance. You have to have special circumstances for fossilization. Rarity so doesn't even I, address it. So if I find a fossil, fossiliferous limestone is actually a type of limestone that exists. It's you find fossiliferous limestone is a the pods of limestone that's super full of fossils, hence the name. And that would happen, again, geology falls under the idea of depositional systems, depositional environments. So if you happen to have a lot of fossils in limestone, that limestone deposition must have been in a way to have a lot of fossils. The exact mechanism, I'm not super familiar with off the top of my head, but the fact that we do have some limestone that's very full of fossils and some limestone that's not, would indicate, I would assume, that different depositional environments are arriving because otherwise all limestone would kind of be the same if limestone only has one way to deposit. John, can I screen share something real quick? <clears throat> oh, actually, George, before that goes forward, what I was going to say is I was trying to look up inclusions in limestone, and you do yeah. find a lot of different stuff in limestone. Uh, chert, for example, is a common unique thing that appears in limestone, uh, rather commonly. So it's not, limestone isn't always exclusively this pure, unadulterated, beautiful, wonderful thing. Oh, uh, where, where is it? Dover may be, I don't know. I mean, I haven't, <laughs> I have to look it up, right? But just because you can't just say limestone is pure and call it a day, limestone isn't uniform. Uh, we don't know of any conglomerate limestones. Who, I who didn't knows say conglomerate. That? Well, 
uh, your statement that limestone is not nearly pure everywhere we find it is not true. Fossiliferous limestone. Look it up. It's limestone that's covered in fossils. Every, fossils. Every, every, but every basic. That's not a different type of material. Case. That's fossils. That's a different. No, it's limestone that is chock full of fossils. Exactly. It's, so, it's, it's not chock full of mudstone or sand or, 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 or other materials. Clay. I was adjusting George's comment about I was adjusting you and George's comment about fossils. So it's still pure, it's just full of fossils. Nearly pure. Well, you guys need to define pure better. This is yeah, I, I think, think you're just not willing to to acknowledge it because you know that's a problem for you. John, uh logical possible problem. Well, could I screen share something for just a moment? Uh, uh, I, I just those I just, sly just, little just, insults you decide to throw at end of stuff. It's not an insult. It, really it, cool. I'm, I'm just being honest, man. Mm, no, honest. it's honest. So it's an insult. Good point. My bad. No, I'm being honest. Uh, you're, you're, you know, you, you don't have an answer for it. No, no, no geologist. I, don't, has I an said at the beginning of this, I don't have an answer for every single thing because I studied my particular burn. I can try to explain to the best of my capability, and that's what I'm trying to do here. But to assume that I don't know, I'm whatever you just said because I can't answer every particular question. It's dishonest on your part. This is supposed to be a conversation. I'm sorry, I don't have every okay, answer. Well, man. well no, I, I, I mean, I, we're presenting facts to you, and and um, you, yeah, you actually misrepresented the thing. You, you said, well, we've got this non-pure stuff, but it's not non-pure. It's just littered with more fossils. Well, so yeah. then I, I have Isn't to go that back. Kind of disingenuous. Again, I got a couple. I got a couple minutes to go here, but I gotta go back. What? Is, how are we defining pure? Is pure like different chemicals involved? Is pure like different sedimentary types? Different sedimentary materials. materials. And as in like mixed together? Is that the point? Yeah, we're talking about different sedimentary materials mixed together. Where's all the clay and the sandstone? How can where's all the and not have okay? Yeah, you have to ask someone that knows limestone better than me. (laughs) Oh, I'm gonna have to look it up and you know, I, I can't guarantee I'm going to spend a lot of time on limestone. So I, <laughs> I, I got a quick question for Orge. Uh, what's the oldest history book that you consider to be historically accurate? Oldest history book? Yeah. That I consider historically accurate. You got it. On what subject? History. Um, well, like military history, like uh, political it's history, like the bot. Are we considering the Bible a history book? Oh yeah, the sure. the Bible, that's uh, right. uh, oldest history book. Um, I to be historically accurate. I was just curious, what is your oldest history book you consider to be historically accurate? My own is it like two hundred years old. That's maybe written by a secular person, or you know, I hate to say the term, but like you know, I won't even say it today. But uh, yeah, what is the oldest uh, book you consider to be historically accurate? You know what? I'm uh, yes. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. I'm I sorry. know you got to leave soon, so I just wanted to tell you. Like uh, I know you have a baby on the way, and I had uh, I had some kids that are now older. And one of my biggest regrets, because I've only been a younger creationist for about three years, is that I told them that they came from a nothing explosion in a fish. Uh, so you know, I just uh, I hope that you uh, you can at least present to your baby uh, both sides. Um, but yeah, back to the question: What is the oldest book you consider historically accurate? <laughs> um, I don't know, The Republic by Plato. It's the Bible, Oga. I said the Bible, but he didn't take it. No, that's cool. So, if if you consider the Bible to be the oldest historic book that's historically accurate. And then it's got, you, it's got some uh, there's actually a passage for you where 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 it talks about people that that they're willingly ignorant ignorant of the flood. And you say you heard Ken Hobbin, where I never heard about him until about three years ago, two years ago. So you know, I was just uh, I was just pointing that out because uh, you know I I might burn in hell for teaching my kids they came from a nothing explosion in the fish. So I hope you don't make the same mistake. <laughs> so I, I, I hope you'll pay attention to the video I've been showing on the screen. This is one of numerous sedimentology experiments that have been performed since the 1950s in university settings. And what they show is that rapidly moving water with a mixture of different materials in that water 
uh, it produces the water automatically sorts the materials with paper thin boundaries by leading edge grain distribution and that's exactly what we see throughout the entire geologic column of the planet find distinct boundaries produced right before your very eyes in real time it doesn't take thousands of years now for it if there were thousands of years involved, the materials would mix, blend one strata, would blend in, into the other. You would not have these fine, distinct boundaries from one material to another where you okay, could. You're arguing a point it. I wasn't arguing now. No, I'm yeah. just pointing out to you. Apples and oranges here. See, for example, what you're seeing right now is a strata forming right before your very eyes, left to right. You're confu you, I think you're conflating strata and bedding here. No, I'm this talking is about just, different depositional environment. The, the, the material. No, the material at the bottom is bedding. What you see moving across the top is a strata forming, with a paper thin boundary between it and the one below it. And this is exactly what we see in the entire geologic column across the Earth. And uh, so we we use uh, operational science to demonstrate what we see in the geologic column. But that's if, not what if, the geologic column looks like either. If, if it, it is exactly what the geologic exactly. column looks like. Throughout Where? Everywhere. What, the entire world looks like that? Uh, what was, it has these fine boundaries and grain size distribution. Yes. That I, Well, again, we're going to have to uh, disagree on that now. I'm You're sorry, saying particle but... size distribution is not a feature of the majority of the strata of the Earth? And again, you, we have you studied, you have you studied, you studied geology you at university. You put words in my mouth. You studied um, geology at university, and you're telling me you have never heard a professor tell you that that that, that strata have uh, particle size distribution as a feature of the majority of the strata. That go am, am I? Someone want to back me up on this? I did. Did I say that, or is he trying to put words in my no, mouth? I know you say that this is not what we see in the geologic column. I'm saying it is. Even yeah, university yeah. geologists. You were, very, you, you were this persistent 10 years ago. Too. I'll give no, you credit. I, I'm just telling you a fact, okay? You go to take your geology at a, a university, they're going to teach <laughs> you that the sedimentary strata of the geologic column have particle size distribution is a major feature throughout the whole geologic column. That's, that's taught in every university, geology, advanced geology course. As I said... Well, I don't know what an advanced geology course is. They don't have names like that. But a well, the grain size is course. not dependent. The grain size of a uh, particular stratum, a particular bedding layer, is primarily dependent on what was being deposited. Sandstone has a larger grain size than fine or very fine mudstone, siltstones, shales. That's and not because... They would all deposit and lay it at the same time. That's because sand comes from a different thing. The mud comes from. Well, now you're 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 saying, um, well, it doesn't. And right now, you what you've done is you've strawmanned the point because by pointing out the relatively few types of strata that exist that are homogeneous, where it's predominantly one material like limestone, like sandstone, predominantly sand. That that that's not that's not the case for the vast majority of strata, and it. And it doesn't explain the fine part or the fine distinct boundaries between them. I don't understand how limestone could deposit from that video you showed me. But uh, well, George, I gotta cut back to George real quick, please. Well, um, are you still there, George? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to look up limestones, and um, I'm I'm I googled what did I Google here? I googled limestone and shale as an example, and a lot of the mm -hmm. And a lot of the um, images I'm getting up here are limestones interbedded and mixed in with shale units. I found a in between US, a not in between them, like included inclusions. Like you have a mud right, but not mixed together. You've got one interjecting between another in, in, inside another. Yes, right. that's right. an inclusion. Right, but but right, but the not that the materials are mixed together. The one you see. You straw manning again? Thank you, Neff. So, and the other thing I did is I found a USGS um, list of geological units containing limestones. And this list is very broad and talks about many different limestone deposits that are not the same limestone deposit, but mm -hmm. throughout the United States. And this is, a, I think, a useful resource, if you will. 
of showing the vast variety of limestone that actually exists and all the different ages and all the different stacks that, that they exist at in the geologic column. Right, but the limestone, so limestone you're talking is a, about is not is not littered with clay. And it's not littered with, with sand. It's it's predominantly nothing but limestone and then there's a layer of clay. You're saying that, but it, I'm sitting between, here looking at a between, list. Between it so and I mean, another layer of limestone. limestone. See, so you're misrepresenting it. A layer of limestone with a layer of clay or something and then another layer of limestone. Not that the clay is intermixed in the limestone to any serious degree. The limestone is relatively pure. Then there's a relatively pure layer of clay. Then there's a relatively pure layer of limestone. You're trying to make it sound as though the clay and the limestone are mixed together like they would be if you put them both in a pot filled with water and stirred it. That's not what it is. Again, That's not what we see. Take a take a quick Google. Look at this USGS list. I think it was. Let me figure it out. It was the Bristol <laughs> data is on the list here, and you can go and you can look at some of these limestone deposits that uh, most modded sandy clay and residual clay scattered with layers of gravelly medium coarse sand, fossiliferous chert, and limestone borders and atomic sand masses. Mm -hmm. This is a limestone that is not as pure as the White Cliffs of Dover. Part of the reason the White Cliffs of Dover are so well known is because they're white, right? Not as pure. Okay. So there are some that are not as pure. They're still predominantly limestone, right? And you were well, talking about an Now we have a moving goalpost here now. And, well, you were talking about an inclusion, which is not what you're talking about now. They have both of these. That You have limestone as an inclusion. You have limestone as part of the mixture. You have different gradients of limestone. You Not say limestone like it's one solid thing, like every. But, but here's the problem: you can't have any relatively pure layer of limestone under uniformitarianism. None. Well, and I, and I have to. I'm sorry, I gotta cut off here a little bit. But then I have to fall back on my original point. I'm no master of limestone. How do yeah, you get? How do you get the white cliffs of Dover? How do you get white cliffs of Dover? I can answer that at this very moment. Um, does that mean there is not an answer? No, that there isn't. That. Within uniformitarianism, you can't have a single. You can't have a. a, a and I, you can't have a massive you column of sandstone. You can't have a massive column of limestone. Limestone, especially with a fine distinct boundary between it and the mudstone above it. Or yeah, we have different. As I said, uh, I'm going to cut back to George real quick. Again, different colors of limestone. <laughs> my point I'm trying to make here. My final point I'm trying to make is this the is what I started out with. My my point is. You, you talk about these uh, layers as if they're monoliths, as if I say limestone, there's this one type of limestone, and that's the end of it. And that is an incorrect statement. There's not one type of sandstone. There's not one type of mudstone. Yes. There's not one type of limestone. You're, you're, you're trying uh, to diminish the fact that the limestone, wherever we find it, is relatively, if not nearly, completely pure. That is a fact, and that's what you're trying really well, then hard. Well, you're going to have to cite me this this website that says oh, I know I've already studied all that so. stuff. What you're doing is well, misrepresenting. Help me. You're misrepre gonna... Well, you're misrepresenting the facts. It sounds like you want me to take your word for can, it. <laughs> can I answer him, Neff? Yeah, George, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, Ogre, I, yes. I agree with the inclusions. Did you know? Did you know in um, in the Grand Canyon we find nautiloids in the standing position? Their inclusions. How does a uh, nautiloid get fossilized uh, in, in a that limestone layer in the standing position over thousands of years? Not nautiloids, like nautilus shell, like the fossil you mean? Yeah, 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 yes, sorry. Okay, it's my Australian yeah. accent, nautiloids, yeah. <laughs> it's cool, it's cool. Uh, how do you get those in standing positions? I would assume the same way you'd get any polystrate fossil. Um, the Something happened, uh, some sort of turbulence arrested and the shell happened to be buried in the correct conditions to where it could cross layers but at, somehow. I but mean. at the but at the rates at the rates of one cent one to two centimeters per thousand years, you expect the nautiloid to sit around there for that long? Well no, I didn't say that either. So uh, you're talking about in limestone, you have this thing standing in limestone, right? I might I might have yes. missed it too. Okay. Yes, they they found that's not just the one isolated nautiloid. They they literally found like hundreds. They estimate probably millions are actually bur buried, but there's yeah. a high proportion of them that are actually buried in the standing position. And you're right, they've actually simulated 
uh, flume experiments where, where they've shown that the only way they could be buried in the standing position is if there were turbulence. Mount, Mount yeah, St. Okay? Helens. But, but, the que- but the question yeah. is, is they were buried quickly, Ogar. I didn't say they weren't. Oh. Well, this, <laughs> this is our point. This is our point. If, if, the, if, if limestone formed at the rate of one to two centimetres per thousand years, you would find what Neff was saying, th- that, that um, mixture of other materials with the limestone. And you would find no fossil in it. Uh, even dinosaurs have been found, bones have been found in limestone, nearly completely articulated crustaceans and fish. Um, and that can't be because if a fish dies and falls to the ocean floor, it, it oh, can't be God. covered with limestone material with uh, uh, calcium carbonate over a period of so many thousand years that it takes, you know, eight, ten thousand years just to cover the things, bones thoroughly. And then you need multiple feet above that for it to be compacted into a solid material, squeeze the water out before it becomes rock. That, that organism is going to be completely devoured by predators in the ocean, even including oceanic worms. You know, There'll be nothing in, in, in a year. Nothing. Sure, sure. Uh, again, I'll have to go back to my original point. Fossilization isn't something I stood. I, I did paleomagnetics. So I'll just go ahead and say that. I did paleomagnetics. I didn't do fossilization. I didn't do limestone. I didn't do all those other. Well, let me give you a little thing to think about. No. Um, scientists have found uh, dead whales yeah. on the ocean floor, and they marked their position with GPS, and they came back six months later, and the whales half gone. They come back one year later to that same exact location, and there is nothing. Yeah, not a, thing, not a single shred of bone. That In is, one year, an is. entire whale is gone. Yes, they got time got time lapse to that. Right, and so, we have whale fossils, and the reason some things are fossils and some things aren't is a result of the way it died, how it died, what it died in. How rapid Not every it whale buried. is going to be a fossil, thank God. Otherwise, right. everything but, would be a fossil. And but all the fossils stuck. that do exist in these materials had to have been buried by a tremendous amount of material very rapidly. That is, rapidly, rapidly. That is very That's possible. Key point. I, I, I'm it, not saying it, that these fossils. I'm not saying that fossils couldn't be buried rapidly. You guys seem to be making an argument. No, to be, to be to be fair, to be fair, then you might you might say that there's many. There could be many uh, catastrophes that would cause many floods to bury many different fossils. Would that be a fair statement? I I think if I, um sure it's late. I'm tired. <laughs> okay, yeah, I um, understand. You're being a good sport. I, yeah, I think it's much more. I in my view is that I would much more lean towards the fossilization as a result of certain happenstances or something happened, as Danny Petrus likes to quote up there. Something happened that caused the fossilization in that particular place in that particular time. Some other particular place in time, uh, fossilization did not occur because the whale was ate away in a year. Yes, those two are separate instances. Not every whale that dies is going to fall into fossilization. Not everywhere that dies is going to fall into uh, being eight in a year. I think you can have both. And yeah, that's, yeah. And if, and if a uh, turbulence, if a flood, if XYZ happened to cause that, top hit, uh, you know, Jurassic Park, amber and a bug, whatever it is, I think these are all very possible. I mean, and the thing that, the, 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 the you breaks are not up, are you? The thing that breaks that up, though, is the fine. We come back to the fine, distinct boundaries between the materials, oh. verifying that the, the one material is abruptly no longer de- deposited, and another is being deposited directly on top of it. And there, if if uniformitarianism were true, the materials would gradiate from one into another. They wouldn't be a material suddenly stop. <laughs> and that only uh, yeah, you'll be credit enough. enough. You, uh, you, your voice is like not cracked at all. And you've been <laughs> that. And, and then, before, before, before you go, I must ask you one thing. If you, I know yeah, you got to go. Um, have, have you heard about soft tissue uh, um, being found? Yes, the di- dinosaur soft tissue yeah, and, and the cool condition, stuff. the conditions that it was found in. Yeah. You know, be, being like just like a foot underneath the ground, in a, like a broken tri- triceratops uh, um, horn. Tri- triceratops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Pardon yeah, yeah, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> I'm, I'm just pretending. Like, 
yeah, John that's Sarah Clopped. <laughs> John Sarah <laughs> Clopped. I apologize. But yeah, um, it's it wasn't perfectly preserved in any way. Um, so, I mean, it, it had to um, survive all these millions of years being exposed to grass, um, uh, I mean, excuse me, roots, um, soils being coming through there, the f- f- freeze, thaw cycles. What a bacteria. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Anaerobic I mean, bacteria. So. Yeah, um, that, and and again, I, I think that would fall. Uh, this is my last thing. I got to leave. I'm tight as Yeah, something. I understand. Um, but again, I would argue that there is something happened. There is a particular situation that allowed that fossil to be preserved in that manner, right? That's obviously not true for every particular piece of flesh that's ever died and laid on the ground, right? Um, I'm sure that Triceratops' buddy five feet over, he didn't survive because something happened to Triceratops A that didn't happen to Triceratops B. They may have died at the same time, but we only have evidence of this one. Oh, no, there's more than that. More than one. Well, there's, as an there, example, there's a plethora. As a specific example, yeah, right. Well, I would I mean, argue. I would argue you shouldn't find one in 65 million years. Well, I, I, be... I, I'm using one as an example, not one. Yeah, as I know. Example. I know that. I know you are. But I'm saying, I, I would <laughs> yeah. argue you couldn't. You shouldn't find one. But well, okay, man, you've been a good sport, bud. I'm yeah. sorry to. If we okay. like you, feel I'm like going we're pressing you or something. But you, you you're the only one in here. Not too late. I officially don't like any of you. Good night. <laughs> Good night, y'all. <laughs> Good night. Thanks for joining. 